Now, Psalm 18 has 50 verses. We're going to read a few of the passages. We're not going to read and treat every single verse of this particular psalm, but we're going to read a good portion of it today. But we're going to start by reading the first six verses of Psalm 18. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. Hear the words of the living God. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. These are the words of the Lord. Now, not only is this one of the longest psalms, especially in book one of the Psalter, but also contains one of the longest titles of all of the Psalms. I don't know if you can see that uh, there in your Bible, but it's, it's a lot of words there. But what we know immediately is the author of this Psalm is David, the king of Israel. And it tells us the reason for the occasion of this particular Psalm. It says, uh, a Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of this song to the Lord. So he's writing this to the Lord. And as we go through it and, and, and read it, you can see that it is directed to God. But he's writing these words, look, on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Now, it says in the day the Lord delivered him, but then it's referencing multiplied deliverances. So we know he's not just referring to one time here. Okay. But the fact that he's saying this is about all of the times, God, you have delivered me from the hand of all of my enemies, gives us an indication that this was likely written toward the end of David's life. As he's looking back uh, at how God has worked in his life and every time that he's been in a mess and every time he's found himself in trouble, every time he's been surrounded by enemies, how God has graciously rescued him. All right. And you'll find this very psalm in 1 Samuel 22. Uh, There in that historical narrative of the life of David, this psalm is embedded there, and it's there, it was placed there by the the writers, the editors, the scribes who put together the book of 1 Samuel. They inserted this particular psalm there. It's uh, very fitting that it would be found there toward the end of David's life, which is when this likely was written. This is a psalm of thanksgiving. If we had to categorize this psalm, largely that's what you'd find here. David is praising God. He's giving thanks to God. And again, not for just one single deliverance, but for multiplied deliverances here. And the psalm also is kind of a messianic psalm. And you'll see as we go through this, and especially towards the end, uh, these messianic themes, these messianic Uh, undertones of what they're pointing to are found or littered throughout this psalm. So much so that Calvin, writing in his commentary of this psalm, said this, that this psalm, in in it, David shows that his reign was an image and type of the kingdom of Christ. For this purpose, to teach and assure the faithful that Christ, in spite of the whole world and of all the resistance which it can make, will be by the stupendous and incomprehensible power of the Father, always be victorious, okay? And this psalm, I encourage you to read it in its entirety. I encourage you to meditate in it, is a masterful work of poetry, masterful work of Hebrew poetry. It is rich in metaphors and images and painting vivid pictures here of our strong deliverer of God's deliverance of David and God's deliverance of his people. And my prayer uh, has been, as I've studied this psalm, as we study it today, that it would cause us to marvel at our strong deliverer, just as David marveled at his strong deliverer, and cause us to thank him for the many things he's delivered us from and for the many things he has yet to deliver us from and most certainly will. 
Let's look at that opening line there and uh, this first section of praise for the deliverer in these first three verses here. He opens this by declaring his great love for the Lord. The Lord there is Yahweh, the covenant name of God. I love you, O Lord. I love you. And this is David's God. This is whom he's addressing it to, and he's expressing his love for God. God is the one he serves. God is the one he worships. What an expression of intimacy, right? Imagine a husband never telling his wife or a wife never telling her husband that he loves her. It's inconceivable. How much more those who've received the love of God, someone like David who's experienced the steadfast love of God, not now be able to express that back to God. I love you, God. Such a depth of intimacy. And he says, he calls him my strength. And the Lord, as we go through the psalm, you'll see is the source of David's uh, uh, many triumphs. His many triumphs over his enemies and, and his adversaries and all of the adversities that he faced in life. And he's going to bolster that argument immediately uh, because David has personally witnessed and experienced strong deliverance in the face of adversity. He, he gives here several divine characteristics of Yahweh's protection and help. And look at the possessive adjective in front of all these. My, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my refuge, my shield, my salvation, my stronghold. This tells me that for David, this is not just uh, theoretical knowledge that he has about God. I, I, I know in my head that God can be a rock. To his people can be a stronghold, a fortress, a refuge, their shield. This isn't just something he knows in his head. This is something he has personally witnessed, something he has personally experienced. The salvation of God. Every time he turned to the Lord for rescue, this is what he found to be true. And those particular terms there, you know, are are battle terms, aren't they? They're, They're military terms. This fortress and stronghold and shield and refuge. David would be acquainted with those things. He was familiar with battle. He was a man of war, continually going out to war. He was the king. And as king, he was the protector and defender of his people. He knew that right well. And here he's saying of God, who is his great king, Yahweh, he, the great king, is able to protect and deliver those who call on him. For the people of God, for David in particular, Yahweh is a safe defensive position that he could trust and flee to for refuge. You think about strongholds. David knew a lot of those things when he was fleeing from Saul because that's where he would go to hide from Saul. These, these, these caverns and, uh, and these treacherous mountain terrains and he would hide himself there. Wilderness places that provided him strategic advantages. He would know when Saul or his army was was coming for him. It would provide not just a place to hide, but then from there he could escape to other strongholds. When you think of fortresses, you think of those fortified places with high, impenetrable, unbreachable, and unassailable walls to keep people out and keep those within safe and free from harm. He says the Lord is his shield, this impenetrable shield, so that the adversities of life would not touch David or destroy him. All of these images signify what God has been to David, a refuge, a protection, a deliverer. It's like this force field around David. Like I love Star Trek, right? All these sci-fi movies, man, they're in space. What does every ship have? Some type of force field, right? Always frustrate me. You know, I'm watching Star Trek, man. These photon torpedoes are coming at the Enterprise, and now we see the shields depleting, right? They were at 100%. Now they're at 70%, and somehow it always goes from uh, from like 70 to 19, like after two hits. And I'm like, they're about to be destroyed. But that's that's not in view here at all because look what he's saying about the Lord. Whatever shield he is around David will never be depleted. It is unbreakable. It is impenetrable. 
God does not need to recharge his force field. Now, we know that all these things that David is saying about the Lord and these words he's using, the Lord is not literally those things. He's not literally a rock or literally a shield. We know that. David is making a very important and profound point. And that is that he relies on the Lord in the way that all humans in distress rely on whatever it is that would give them an advantage in the situation that they are facing. For some, that might be their own strength. They're going to take advantage of that. They, they're strong. They have some military might and strength, and they will try to use that to their advantage. Some then are maybe the advantage for them is that they're hiding behind thick walls that hopefully will not be breached. For others, they might have powerful allies that they can call and summon in the moment of distress and need. For others, they might be un- have taken the high ground, so they have a uh, tactical position over their enemy. It may just be superior weapons, but whatever it is, David is saying there are those who trust in those things that they believe will give them an advantage against their enemies. David's enemies might have had those things. They may be stronger. They may be more uh, superior militarily and tactically. But David has something far better, doesn't he? He has the Lord. The Lord is with him. That's David has. That is his strategic advantage in every battle. And whenever he would call on the Lord, he would taste the sweetness of deliverance from his enemies. He's confident in the Lord's ability to deliver him. That's why he's praising the Lord. That's why he's thanking God in this particular psalm. He says, I call on the Lord, and I am saved from my enemies. That's the formula. Like, that's his winning formula. I call on the Lord, and deliverance comes. I am saved. I am rescued. It's the reason he experienced success in every battle. He could trust that the Lord was with him, that the Lord would protect him, and God would rescue him. Now, let's look at this section here in 4 through 6 that we just read. Because now he's going to give us a report of previous or past distress. And we can't tie it to any one specific thing. Because he's saying this is about all of the times God has delivered me. All the times God has rescued me. but, But especially that time that he delivered me. From Saul. And in verses 4 to 6, he is, he's framing there how he felt in those times of distress. H- how he felt in times of adversity. David had feelings. Imagine that, a man with feelings, and he's expressing them. Yeah, he's doing that here, right? He's recalling the intensity of his anguish. Listen to to the words he uses there. The cords of death encompass me. He he felt as if if death was circling all around him and it was putting a rope around him and pulling him down to the grave, pulling him down to Sheol. Torrents of destruction assailed me. Imagine that. Imagine falling into a a river with raging rapids and and being swept away and possibly drowned. He's feeling, and whatever, when the enemy was against him, maybe when Saul was was persecuting him and and seeking to kill him, that this is how he felt. Like, I'm going to die. Death is like a vulture circling around me, and I'm being pulled down to Sheol. Snares of death confronted me. Snares. He felt trapped. He could not find a way of escape. Remember, he's a fugitive running from Saul, seeking to kill him. He's always looking over his shoulder, feeling Saul closing in on him, like breathing down his neck. I would imagine he's there in whatever stronghold he is, you know, just waiting, waiting for the shoe to drop, waiting for the blow to come. Now, that's how David felt, and we probably not experienced distress at the level that David has expressed. And we've looked at that a little bit when we looked at the third psalm. But we've all experienced adversities. 
We've all experienced some type of challenge in life, some difficulty, some exceedingly painful situation. And we've not been able to see a way out of it. We have felt trapped. We have felt like we are circling the drain. Maybe you've experienced a circumstance where it's felt like there's a noose around your neck and it's tightening. We've had enemies that have seemingly seemed like they're going to triumph over us. We can look at this, just expand it to the people of God, expand it from the individual, right? It feels like the enemies of the cross are triumphing in our day. This is what David experienced. This is what he felt, and we can certainly um, sympathize with his feelings because we've tasted some of that in our own life. But what we find here in verse 6, that it is at this very moment of distress that David remembers to call Upon the Lord. It's the repeated pattern of David's life. We're going to see this over and over and over again in the Psalms. It was not only a reflexive response in moments of distress and trouble, because certainly he's doing that here. Prayers was the very thing that David breathed out of his lung. His was a life of prayer, not just in a moment of distress. When you read through the Psalms, when you read the story of David's life, he's always praying. He's always turning to the Lord for guidance and counsel. He's always worshiping God. His his was a life of devotion and worship to God. He's always offering sacrifices unto the Lord, not just when he was in trouble. Prayer was a spiritual response to any and every situation of David's life, not just when his enemies were at his door. Seeing that distress is contradictory contradictory to God's promises of protection that David takes to prayer, he cries out to the Lord for help. And he can do that because he trusts that Yahweh will respond. In keeping his covenant with him to protect him, in keeping his covenant with David that he would establish his kingdom forever through his seed, through his descendant, he knows that God would hear and God would come to his aid and rescue him from the very depths of Sheol. I wish that we would learn to trust God that way. I wish that ours was a a, a life of prayer this way. See, because if you've not cultivated a life of prayer, when things go from bad to worse, because that is just life. David here knows God's going to deliver him, but David needs deliverance, doesn't he? Like, he's in something. He's in the mud. He's in a mess. He's in trouble. But if we've not cultivated a life of prayer, when we are in those moments, then it's hard for us to pray. Because prayer isn't instinctive. It's not reflexive. Many times we're in that situation, if, if, if we don't have this habit of coming to the Lord in the good and in the bad then prayer is hard. And we're crowded with doubts and uncertainty about even if God will even listen to us in the middle of all of this. But a child of God that talks to God when everything seems to be going well, when they're walking in blessing and ease, will reflexively turn to God and cry out for help when it seems like the wheels are coming off, coming apart in our life. In our moments of distress, in our times of trouble, we will call on the Lord. I'll plead with you every time we come to these uh, aspects of David's intercession that we remember that that's, that needs to be the pattern of our life as well. We call on the Lord for everything at all times. Now let's look at this strong deliverance that comes to David from heaven in verses 7 to 19 here. David's cry from the pit of despair and distress from the very depths of Sheol was heard from the heights of heaven. What we have here is a dramatic description of God's response to David calling for help. And in in verses 7 through 15, which we're not going to read all of this in its entirety, David gives us a glimpse of God's reaction and and his response. And then what we'll see in verses uh, 16 through 19, a description of that deliverance itself. But let's just read 7 through 12 there. 
about God's response. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds dark with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. That is a frightful and terrifying portrayal of the Lord's coming from heaven to rescue and deliver. David, it's a scene straight out of a fantasy action novel or, or movie. I mean, picture, picture that in your mind, what, what's happening here. Now, I've read the accounts of David's life, the times he's been in trouble and called on the Lord, and I've never seen this particular response. I don't see it in 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel or 1 Kings. I don't, I don't see a response like this here, right? This is more reminiscent of, of, of the Exodus story, isn't it? Of how God supernaturally delivered his people. And, and it certainly strikes the images of, of Moses going up to Mount Sinai to receive the law from God. And we find the earthquake and the thunder and the lightning and the smoke and the clouds and the fire. That's the image that David is putting in our minds here as the kind of response he's getting from God who's, who's heard his cry for distress and is now coming to deliver him. This is meant through this vivid, striking, and powerful imagery to dramatize God's response. This is theophonic language. Theophanies in scriptures are manifestations of of God's coming before Christ here. And that's what we have in this particular language. It's anthropomorphic. He's ascribing to God these other characteristics, these human characteristics. In fact, even of creatures. I mean, I I read some of this description, and I think of this fire-breathing dragon. Like smoke and fire consuming things here. But this is poetry, isn't it? This is not what God looks like. This is, this is not actually what's taking place here. Okay? But he's using that to describe the coming of the Lord in rescue. The Exodus and Sinai imagery suggests that David sees his own personal deliverance from his enemies as his own personal exodus out of Egypt and from Egypt. That God parting his enemies is like God parting the Red Sea to deliver his people and then consume and drown his enemies. And then coming to Sinai is David making a covenant with Yahweh. He sees God as this divine warrior king who leaves his throne, leaves his temple, exiting the temple and now mounting the cherub. Now the cherub is not this cute little bunny looking kid, you know. Now they make the little cherubs like these little baby faces there. Cherubs are terrifying creatures, right, as described in Scripture, especially in Ezekiel here. And it's like, like him mounting one of those cherub and just kind of swooping down like a bird, downward to the earth on the, on the, on the wings of the wind. And, and, and at his coming, when he sets foot on the earth, man, this, there is earthquake, and the earth reels and rocks and shakes as an expression of his anger. Smoke and fire, his readiness to avenge David's enemies. Then he says the brightness of the Lord's radiance here is is contrasted with these thick, dark clouds that surround God. And he sees the Lord kind of like wearing this darkness, these thick clouds as a blanket and the brightness of his glory shining through to consume his enemies. Fire going out from before him. The blast of his nostrils in that passage, the seas part and the foundations of the earth are laid bare. What a terrifying picture of the judgment come in deliverance for David from his enemies. Nothing can oppose Yahweh. Nothing can stand in his way. He's the glorious and victorious king over heaven and over earth and over the seas. Is there a question in this passage of the sovereignty of God? 
Is there a question in what David is describing here about the supremacy of God to do the very thing that David is calling upon him to do, and that is to deliver him? No, there's no question. God is all-powerful. God can do it, and this is the picture of God's response to David's cry for help. He depicts his strong deliverance as coming from his strong deliverer. And that's why he uses this poetic language and these, this, this language to portray God's power, might, and victory. What an amazing picture of the power and determination of God to save. Now, I wish when we called upon the Lord in our time of need, like this would be the response. Wouldn't that be amazing? Because then we believe he is delivering us, you know. If I said, oh, God, smite that one who's persecuting me, and then, you know, they're consumed, you know, we're like, yes, God, you are real, and you deliver, and you save. But many times the deliverance and our salvation and our rescue is is hidden from view. We don't see these kind of images, so sometimes we feel like God's not at work. But David didn't really see these things, yet he knew they were true. God's power and deliverance were nevertheless real. That's the confidence David had, that God would rescue him. And it should be our confidence as well that God not only has delivered us, but will deliver us. For God is always powerfully and passionately working on behalf of his people, even when we don't see it. And we have to trust that like David did. Now look at David's comfort and deliverance in in verses 16 through 19. We have this terrifying snapshot of God's fury, his indignation, and readiness to vindicate David. And that gives him comfort. And it would as well. I think think we would have that mixture of terror and also comfort, right? Like, yes, that's my God. That's the Lord, my strength, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. And my enemies, they're blown apart, right? Look at Psalm uh, 18. Let's just read 17 through 19. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because, look at this, he delighted in me. I love that. David's enemies were were strong. They were powerful. They were certainly stronger than him, but they were not more powerful than God. Just as Egypt was stronger than Israel, the Lord delivered David just like he delivered Israel's stronger enemy. Instead of David experiencing calamity and defeat, he experiences the Lord as his support. Instead of distress, the Lord brings him out into wide open spaces. Instead of him tasting death at the hands of all of the enemies that that hated him, David experiences deliverance by the hand of the God who delights in him and loves him and cares for him. What a faithful God. What a powerful deliverer. David doesn't fear God coming in, in anger because he sees God as a loving father. He sees the steadfast love of the Lord that provides him strong deliverance. Now, in verses 20 through 30, uh, David's going to provide the reasons why God brought about this strong deliverance. Why God so powerfully rescued him. And there's two. One's going to be based on the faithfulness of David. And the second is based on the faithfulness of God. And you'll see these in these two sections. And again, I want to encourage you to go back and study this and and really just spend some time walking through this particular psalm. But in verses 20 through 24, I want you to see the character of David's faithfulness as he defines it and describes it. 20 through 24. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of Of my hands he rewarded me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and his statutes I did not put away from me. 
I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from my guilt. So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Now, it sounds, as you read this, like David is saying that God did everything he did for David because of all of the things that David has done for God. Sounds like he's bragging about his own righteousness. Look at me, you know, look how clean I am. Look how pure I am. Look how blameless I am before the Lord. That's, you read this, and it sounds like he's being rewarded for his own righteousness, his self-righteousness even. We might read it that way. But we know that goes, you know, uh, uh, against everything we know to be true about the gospel and how we attain righteousness here. So how can David claim that? How can David claim blamelessness and having a righteousness of his own? Now, what do we know about David and his life? Well, we know all that scripture tells us about David. God called him. God chose him was appointed to be king of Israel. We know that David loved the Lord and worshipped the Lord. We know that he devoted his life to God, that he loved the law of God, he loved God's word, even though we know he committed serious sin, didn't he? How could he say that he is blameless? Now, his life was characterized by his desire for God, he, 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 there was a striving in him to keep God's covenant and word. But he says he's blameless or righteous or clean. So he's not saying here that this account of his righteousness and purity and blamelessness and cleansing and cleanliness is a, about his own moral absolute perfection. He's not claiming that. And I know that because of what he writes in other Psalms. Read Psalm 51, which is a Psalm of his repentance for his sin, right? When he was confronted by Nathan, the prophet of the Lord, he didn't cling to his own righteousness there. He recognized his grievous sin and he repented. This deep sorrow and contrition found in Psalm 51. So David knows he cannot attain perfect, absolute righteousness because he knows that was not true of himself. And in Psalm 143, too, he writes, enter not into judgment with your servant, For no one living is righteous before you. He acknowledges no human being can truly be righteous before you. But in what he is stating here about his righteousness or his blamelessness, what he's doing is contrasting his faithfulness to God with the wicked who hate God. With the wicked who hate God, hate his law, and hate his king. He's not claiming here that he's earned God's favor. He's not even claiming here that he deserves God's favor and kindness, but rather that the favor of God and the kindness of God have really and truly made David different from those who hate God. Why? Because God's changed him. God, through his work and his word, has changed David. Because of God's steadfast love, now David has come to love the Lord and his law. God first loved him. That's the only reason David could love him. We love God because he what? First loved us. It's not the other way around. God doesn't love us because one day we said, God, I love you. Oh, I guess I should love you too. We know that's not true. God's changed him. God's word has changed him. It's affected the way David thinks. It's it's affected the way David has lived his life. I want you to read Psalm 19 and Psalm 119. You get a picture of how David viewed the word of God, saw the word of God, and how God's word regulated all of his life. God's word is what produced righteousness in David. His character had been molded by the word of God. And God is the one who brought David into covenant with him, not the other way around. It was an unconditional covenant, an unconditional promise God made to him. And it was God who gave him the integrity that he has. The Lord delights in David. He says that in the area. We read that in 19. He rescued me. Why? Because he delighted in me. It was the electing love of God. 
that cause God to delight and love and care for and watch over and protect and deliver David. Right? It's, it's, it's not David's personal accomplishments that's being celebrated here. He's not bragging on those things. As we read the rest of this psalm, you can see he, he's not bragging about himself. He's bragging on God, on God's power and God's might and God's work of deliverance and God's faithfulness and loyalty. So let's look at the character of the Lord's faithfulness in 25 through 30. We'll read those six verses there. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself pure. With the crooked, you make yourself seem tortuous. For you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. And by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. It's beautiful what David's writing here. The Lord helps those who are his. The love of God moves heaven and earth for the sake of his own. That is the kind of God David serves. That is the kind of God we serve. And his own are the ones who are concerned with being faithful and blameless and pure. And that is always in response to God's faithfulness and blamelessness and purity and integrity. So with the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself to be pure. God responds with deep concern to his covenant children. God keeps his word. He shows steadfast love, integrity, and purity to those who show steadfast love, have integrity, and are pure. And then the fourth thing, there's a little interesting He says, with the crooked, you make yourself seem tortuous. Now, some of your translations say shrewd. Would we ever say that God is shrewd? Yeah. You could see that in the story of of the many times God rescues Israel from the enemies. We see it in the account, the Exodus account. We see it in the conquest of the land and all of the enemies of, of the people that were routed under Joshua's leadership. We see God acting in a manner that we might describe as deceptive, but in no way could we ascribe sin to God. And that's what it means here by he shows himself tortuous. He employs subterfuge. And those who go to war against the Lord, those who hate the Lord and hate his people and hate his king, will find God to be stubborn, unmovable, unyielding, and uncompromising. That's the character of God he's talking about there, of his faithfulness to his people. Then he says, for you save a humble people, but the haughty, the arrogant, you bring down. And the haughty he's referring to here are his enemies who are rebellious. They rebel against God. They disregard God and his law. They hate his king. They hate his word. We know God opposes the proud, right, but gives grace to to the humble. And David here is identifying himself with the humble, identifying himself with the afflicted, the persecuted, and he counts himself among those whom the Lord saves. He writes here that it is the Lord who gives him light in darkness and who has enabled him to prevail over his enemies. And verse 30 is a powerful declaration of God's uh, perfect integrity and character and David's unflinching confidence. In, in the ability of God to protect him when he trusts in him. This God, his way is perfect. His word proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge for him. His affirmations of God's perfection and goodness and character are the grounds of his hope. Now, verses 31 to 48, we're not going to read. And you're probably like, oh, good. I'll make it in time for that reservation I have for Mother's Day. You will, you will. We're not going to read them. But there you'll find when you do read this later, 
David expressing expressing the ways that God has enabled him to triumph over his enemies and placed him as head over the nations. But verse 42, he asserts uh, the incomparability of God there in verse 42. Um, And and it's so powerful uh, what, what you find here that he says, for who is God but the Lord? I'm sorry, that's 31. For who is God but the Lord? And it's a rhetorical question. The Lord, right? Is God alone. No one comes close. None can compare, right? He, he's the only one. And it is God, he writes, as you read this, who's equipped him with strength, who's given him integrity. It is God who's given him agility like that of a deer running on craggy heights. It is God who has trained his hands for war. It is God who has given him the ability to bend a bow of bronze. It is God who has given him the shield of God's salvation. And it is God who supports him and uplifts him with his right hand. And it is God who has equipped him with strength for the battle. Those are the reasons why David is now empowered and enabled to pulverize his enemies. And crush them like dust of the earth. And David in all of this attributes his success not to his own military prowess, though he was a skilled warrior. He attributes all of his success and power to Yahweh. In fact, he accesses the prophecy of Genesis 49. The blessing that comes upon Judah and of the, line, and the, the descendant coming of the line of Judah to describe how Yahweh will subdue his enemies and make him ruler over his people. With the help of Yahweh, the great warrior king, David has no fear of his enemies. Why would he? Why would he? Just that dramatic description of the Lord's response is is enough to tell you that David doesn't see, though the enemies are too powerful for him, they are nothing before God. God is the one who strengthens him and will deliver him. No enemy can stand against the Lord's anointed. I love how Joshua encouraged Israel with the words in the conquest here. This is what he told God's people. One man of you puts a flight to a thousand. Since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised you. How many of you would say, one against a thousand, not very good odds that you will survive, right, uh, that conflict. But a thousand against God? What is that? That That's just not going, blowing some some breath out of his nostril and crushes him to the ground. With the help of God, David, the Lord's anointed, becomes head of the nations in fulfillment of God's word to Israel. There's a lot there, but for the sake of time, we're going to move to the last part of this psalm, the last two verses, and I do want you to turn there, 49 and 50. David opens with praise and he closes with praise here. For this I will praise you, O Yahweh, among the nations. This is among the people, the Gentiles. In fact, Dave, uh, Paul in Romans quotes this very particular passage to talk about and, and that, that this actually points to Jesus. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king. And shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. For all of these great deliverances, because of God's perfections, his steadfast love and faithfulness, David declares he will praise God among the nations. This last verse here is is meant to encourage God's people to look at how God has chosen the anointed king of David's lineage to establish his kingdom And to bring about his great salvation. Who is David writing about here? His anointed. Psalm 2. Right? Goes back to that. And David's offspring forever. Offspring is not plural. It's singular. This is the seed. The promised seed of David. The king that would come of the line of David. He is talking about Messiah. That is the anointed. That's the Hebrew word there. David's offspring. That is Jesus. Anytime we say who's the Messiah, 
There's no other answer. <laughs> it's going to be Jesus. You, you can say that with a lot of confidence, right? And I cannot overstate the significance of the reference to David's offspring, his seed here in the closing of this psalm. Because it suggests to us that the history of what God did for David is pointing to what God will do for the seed promised to David. Psalm 18 here is pointing us here to this greater deliverance we have in Jesus, who is our strong deliverer. Because if you took the words of Psalm 18, though they're written by David here, and you read them as if Jesus were speaking these very things, you would get the true meaning of this psalm. Like, it would be amplified dramatically for you. You would see how this points to Jesus Whereas David speaks of his own righteousness and blamelessness because he is in covenant with Yahweh, we know that only Jesus was truly righteous and blameless and pure in every way and thus can grant us his record of perfect righteousness. Whereas David felt threatened and ensnared by the powers of death and Sheol, those very same powers of death actually got their cords around the neck of Jesus And he tasted death in every way to be able to grant to us life. He was killed. He died and was buried. Whereas David uses metaphorical language and images to describe his deliverance and exodus, those events found their ultimate fulfillment in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Whereas David described God's coming and deliverance as an earthquake and thunder and lightning and hailstones and fire at the coming of judgment, at the end of the age, at the return of our Lord, the heavens and the earth will pass away. The heavenly bodies will be burned up with fire and dissolved and the earth and the works of the earth will be laid bare. He will be a blazing fire for those who have refused his gracious reign. Whereas David began to establish the kingdom and conquer the land, only to be hindered by his own sin, Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, conquered every one of his enemies and our enemies. And his kingdom is established forever and ever. Whereas David was Israel's king, his offspring, Messiah, is the king of kings and the Lord of lords the one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. Beloved, this psalm is meant for us to look at Jesus as our strong deliverer. This psalm is to evoke in us the praise and worship and adoration and gratitude and thanksgiving that every blood-bought sinner should have of this glorious strong deliverer that Jesus is. God is always at work in us and for us. He's always working for our good. And we should love the Lord and look to Him as our strength and hope, just like David did here. It's like David, we need to call upon the Lord. Like David, we need to call upon the Lord at all times, not in our distress, because He is our deliverer and He will deliver us just like He promised He would. Calling on Him in the good times. And the bad times, you might be in a bad time right now. And you might be in an exceedingly difficult place in your life right now. And I implore you to turn to the Lord for rescue. And, and it may not all be readily evident how the Lord is delivering you, but you can be confident that He is. He's working out His salvation in us. Whatever storms you're facing in life, God is greater than every single One of them. He is stronger than your strongest adversary. Like David, we should love his word. We should keep his word always before us. We should trust in Christ's righteousness, not our own. Because he is the promised seed of David. The one in whom great salvation and deliverance is found. Beloved, in Christ, all of our strong enemies have been defeated. Every one of them that's stronger than us. Satan. Sin that was our master. And death that has come to all mankind because of the curse. Jesus overcame, conquered, defeated every single one of them.
And in Christ, the Lord delights in us. Isn't that awesome? I love how in, in none of this, there's fear in the heart of David concerning God. Because of the relationship. Because of who God is. Because of God's character of faithfulness. The track, not just the track record, but what is rooted in the very character of God. And he's saying the Lord delights in him. And in Christ that is coming, we will be brought into the wide open places of the new heaven and earth. Where he will wipe away every tear and usher us into his eternal kingdom. Where we will never again taste of sin, of pain, of suffering, and of death. And like David, you and I should be people overflowing with praise and thanksgiving, especially for the great salvation and deliverance that we have in Christ Jesus.